Welcome to the Nanovation Podcast. Information about this and other episodes can be found at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. If you like what you hear, be sure to tell a friend or leave a review at Apple Podcasts. It really does help. I welcome your thoughts and suggestions. You can contact me on Twitter at Michael Filler or via email at nanovationpodcast at gmail.com. NRL was giving me an opportunity to do something completely different. And after talking to some folks I really trusted, they had kind of told me that, you know, postdocs, one of your few opportunities to kind of just dive into something completely different with limited uh, amounts of exposure for your career. And this way you can learn a bunch of new techniques or learn a new field. And so I did that and it worked out really well. That's Josh Caldwell from Vanderbilt University, sharing some career advice for young researchers. Maximize the diversity of your training and make sure to surround yourself with good mentors. On this episode of the Nanovation Podcast, Josh not only gives great career advice, he also talks about his pioneering work in the area of polaritonics. Polaritons are quasi-particles that couple photons to the motion of electrons or atoms in a material, and they allow you to squeeze and manipulate light in nanoscale volumes. This capability may one day allow, for example, surfaces that can cool themselves even when in direct sunlight. We definitely get in the weeds, but that's what podcasts are for. Be sure to stay to the end to hear about some of the differences between life at a national lab and a university. Josh is a do-it-all kind of researcher. His science is routinely superb. He's a great mentor and colleague, and somehow leaves time for podcasts. This is the Nanovation Podcast, an exploration of big innovations emerging from small things. I'm Mike Filler, your host and a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Enjoy the show. So it is a pleasure to have Josh Caldwell on the show today. Uh, he is an associate professor of both mechanical engineering and electrical engineering at Vanderbilt University. And I first met him at a Materials Research Society meeting. Uh, he graciously invited me to visit uh, the Naval Research Lab where he was working, and I've been following his work for several years now and, and very impressed by, by what he has done and what he's doing. So, Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm been looking forward to it for a little while. Yeah, we tried to do this in 2016 when the podcast was much younger, and uh, uh, something got in the way. And uh, it was November 2016. So yeah, I'll let I believe there think was about a, what that was. Some minor event that occurred on election day that year that kind of threw us all for a loop. So right, <laughs> um, but here we are. We're uh, we, we're staying at it. So are you? Uh, is mechanical engineering or electrical engineering your home department? Uh, mechanical is my home department. Okay. So they own you, and electrical engineering lets you play in their sandbox. Yes. I found it interesting that you're from Attleboro, Massachusetts. When I was younger, I was a camp counselor at a camp in Maine, and there were a lot of people from that area. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unlike you might expect, uh, summer camps for... Uh, people up in new england we tend to go to colder places oddly enough so <laughs> apparently 80 degrees is too hot in the summer yeah. if you live in the boston you wouldn't area. want to have to deal with that kind of heat so let's exactly. go to maine where it might be 60 or 70 so. <laughs> um the humidity is a bit better up there too yeah this uh, is true, so. but good point and one of the things i love is that you're a chemist by training yeah i think i'm kind of one of these uh the definitions of uh Jack of all trades, master of none, or if you kind of look at it more of uh, the outcome of a lot of multidisciplinary work. So I always joke with my students that I was a chemist by training who does physics and material science research uh, at a basic level and am now home in an engineering department trying to apply some of those concepts to new ideas. And there's a there's a minor in history sprinkled in there. <laughs> yeah, I actually almost gave up on uh, uh, chemistry in uh, undergrad because of organic chemistry. So ah, okay. so you, 
you, you, you dipped your uh, toe in the water of history and uh, did you recoil or it was kind of like, oh, this is okay. I might as well finish this minor. Long story, but uh, that obviously didn't happen. But uh, at the time, uh, organic chemistry, I just didn't find it all that interesting. I went and talked to my chemistry advisor and speaking to the potential power of advisors, uh, my undergraduate advisor told me that uh, stick it out until physical chemistry and analytical chemistry. A lot of students who don't like organic uh, like one of those. And true to his point, when I took physical chemistry, I was enthralled and completely changed the direction of where my life was going. So, And right, your PhD was ultimately in physical chemistry at the University of Florida. Yeah. But in that case, I was actually housed in the physics department doing uh, magnetic resonance of uh, quantumly confined uh, electromagnetic structures like uh, uh, quantum wells and the uh, uh, quantum Hall effect. I know chemists love it when uh, physicists say that they explain chemistry. Like <laughs> it's physics, <laughs> phys- physics that underlies chemistry. Like, thanks, <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, but uh, so you you got your PhD at the University of Florida, and then you started at the Naval Research Lab not that long thereafter. Yeah, I accepted a postdoc there. Um, it was actually between a potential postdoc in Australia, uh, which I was waiting on final confirmation of, or at NRL. But uh, NRL was giving me an opportunity to do something completely different. And after talking to some folks I really trusted, they had kind of told me that, you know, postdoc's one of your few opportunities to kind of just dive into something completely different with limited uh, amounts of exposure for your career. And this way you can learn a bunch of new techniques or learn a new field. And so I did that and it worked out really well. I recommend to anyone who cares to hear my opinion about it that uh, when you're looking for a postdoc find uh, a postdoc that is in a research area as far removed as you can from your phd research but that you still offer some benefit to your postdoc advisor yeah Um, right along the lines of my advice as well yeah Um, and then you know if you go on to have your own research career a lot of your ideas are just more interesting because you've had that much breadth in what you've worked on yeah um and you can bring those ideas together in interesting and new ways so you have moved up while you were still at nrl you moved up through the ranks getting promoted and becoming you know ultimately a full-time staff member and then getting promoted there i'll put a link to your bio in the show notes because everyone should read it it will it makes you feel bad about yourself basically (laughs) um and one of the things i loved was that uh you were the youngest researcher to be awarded uh the nrl nanoscience institute uh proposal or you know win that proposal competition you were the first proposal out of 110 and so my question is how do you do that uh luck part of it i would say Youthful exuberance in your presentation for the proposal helps. Um, I don't necessarily know if uh, being ranked number one correlates with the best proposal or the best science uh, in all cases because these proposals cross a number of different domains. I would also kind of point out that I'm not sure if I'm the youngest anymore. Uh, at, oh. At the time I was. I'm not sure if I'm not either. So this is interesting, and we can we'll cut back to it on the latter part of the show about how a place like NRL works. But those hundred and ten proposals are all from internal teams, correct? Yes, and so the one thing I will say um, that really helped us get that high rating and getting funded, despite you know my you know youth and inexperience, I, I guess I'll say. Uh, is I had the good fortune of being pair, uh, of finding and pairing with some exceptional researchers at NRL, uh, just to name a few: uh, Jim Long, Jeff Rutsky, Oris Klimbaki, uh Later on, Igor Vagoffman, many many others. Uh, Ron uh, Ron Rendell. Um, and on that first proposal, you know, I had some what I thought were pretty clever ideas that I was pitching that Oris and I had come up together uh, with, and then. It was really the advice of those uh, more experienced researchers that kind of fine-tuned those into something that could win as opposed to, you know, that kind of generic amorphous idea that, uh, you know, you can get excited about but really don't necessarily have the 
background understanding of how to accomplish it. Right. I think that's challenging at the same time, though, because you have, let's say, three people advising you. And anyone who knows researchers is that if you ask three researchers a question, you get nine answers. All right. And so you have to you know, take those inputs and, you know, make it work. Right. And that's not necessarily straightforward. Yeah. In the end, it comes down to you listening to the advice you've been given and deciding which ones you what advice you think is most valid or which ones you want to completely ignore, uh, <laughs> which exactly. especially when you're a new scientist talking with a uh, more advanced scientist, that can be a, a, an interesting dynamic to get started with. Again, right. luckily I had a pretty fantastic team to start with that. Uh, I know I'm overlooking some folks from that beginning, um, but you know, certainly there's a, uh, you know, they were very understanding of, the situation I was put in and they put their advice out there as take it or leave it. But this is what I think, as opposed to me adamantly pushing for any given approach. So, right. Having good mentors is absolutely essential. And I think good mentors are hard to find. Um, so it's just one of those things where it, it, it behooves any young researcher to just talk to as many people as possible and assume that some of them will not be good mentors and a few might be, uh, but that your efforts will be well rewarded when you do find the few people that uh, mentor you well. Um, I wanted to talk about the real brief, the work. So the bio also goes on to say that you had a method uh, for transferring uh, a dry transfer method for graphing. Uh, and that there was a patent that came out of the work, and this patent, or you, I'm not sure, or the team won an Edison Award for the top patent at NRL in 2014, and it says uh, that this technology is widely used commercially and in research. So real quick, can you talk about uh, what you did and what, uh, who uses it today? Yeah, so it was definitely a team. Um, so this was, we actually use uh, thermal release tape. Uh, and UV releasable tape uh, as the basic idea. These are tapes that when uh, they have a very high adhesion or high tack, um, and you can, through uh, various companies, mostly Nidadenko, you can buy a desired strength of that adhesion. But then when exposed to a certain temperature for the thermal release tape or to ultraviolet light, uh, there's also water releasable um, that is now widely used. You can um, uh, get that adhesion to disappear. And so what we did, we were looking to get, uh, in that point, we have a paper in ACS Nano on this, where we use that uh, uh, thermal release tape in that case with a wafer bonding tool to apply a known pressure uh, of a given force to the surface and then uh, peeled off epitaxially grown graphene uh, from silicon carbide and then transfer that over to arbitrary substrates. Uh, this was originally, I think we've when we first started this, this is like 2008. Um, I think the paper was published in around the 2010 time frame. So this is, you know, certainly not at the forefront of when graphene was first discovered, but at that point, you know, and even to this point, you know, basic exfoliation is still pretty widely used. One of the challenges at that time was trying to get large area graphene and epitaxial graphene grown on silicon carbide by a sublimation process was a nice way of potentially getting these large area films. Uh, and so we were able to demonstrate you could transfer that off. We transferred it to a number of different materials from silicon dioxide, sapphire, things with uh, you know lots of dangling bonds, things with no, uh, not so many. Uh, and then we filed a patent on this. Um, I can't discuss potential licensing opportunities, but uh, there had been some. But then there's this basic approach is the approach that Companies like Graphene Supermarket were advertising with their graph, the original graphene transfer uh, sets, where they'd sell you uh, CBD graphene um, grown on copper, typically, uh, with some thermal release tape and uh, um, uh, silicon dioxide and silicon wafer to transfer it to. It was also uh, the general process used for the, roll, the first roll-to-roll -roll transfer technique that was uh, out of a group from Korea, uh, which I believe was funded by Samsung, where they did this roll-to-roll -roll transfer process, where they took CVD graphene, very large sheets of it, I think it was 27-inch uh, diagonal, uh, using thermal release tape, 
and then passed it through uh, etching off the copper and then transferring, uh, basically maintaining freestanding graphene films or transferring it to a polymer uh, template or whatever they wanted it on. Um, so it, yeah, it's been kind of a process that's been used pretty broadly. More techniques have been built upon this or very, using various other ideas, uh, PMMA transfer, uh, like float uh, wet approaches and things like that. But at the time it was one of the, I th I uh, believe, to be fair, it was the first dry transfer approach that had been reported. So, And there's probably a lot of industries that would prefer not to deal with the, the wet approach. Yeah, especially with graphene, because anything on the surface of that material is uh, going to influence its uh, chemical potential and therefore its electronic and optical properties. Um, and then more generally, you can use this for transferring a number of other uh, 2D materials or Van der Waals crystals, these you know atomically thin um, uh, uh, Van der Waals bonded materials like graphite and things like that. Right. So for instance, hexagonal boron nitride or transition metal dichrocotinides. So it's, um, it's one of the rubs of 2d materials, right? The <laughs> fact that they have really interesting physics and, uh, potentially useful materials properties, except, uh, they're all surface all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it's not just, do I have to deal with the surface? Uh, and I have this, this bulk property that I, I really care about. It's no, you're going to deal with the surface all the time. And so any little thing on there matters. Um, that's a great segue, I think, into, uh, your research area, which I would characterize as broadly in nanophotonics and metamaterials. And you've really emphasized the infrared part of the spectrum, and the far infrared, um, just keep going out until you run out of wavelengths, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, so I wanted you to first talk about what it what is nanophotonics and metamaterials, and then and, and maybe a little bit about how they emerged, and um, then we'll we can dive into talking about why the infrared part is, of the spectrum is interesting and how these um, approaches are useful. Okay, so I guess I will I, the, probably the easiest place to start is uh, a polariton. Uh, this is a quasi-particle that uh, encompasses a um, uh, oscillating charge, a coherently oscillating charge, and a photon uh, uh, light, right? A quanta of light. And one of the um, key things to uh, uh, look at within these systems is that by combining a photon of light with um, uh, this oscillating charge, if you can create this quasi-particle, what you're really doing is you're compressing the wavelength of that light down to a size scale that's approaching that of the charged particle. So if you think of an electron a whole as your charged particle, you, in principle, if you had no loss, could get down to this atomic scale of confinement, right? The basic physics of this, polaritons were well known going back even into the 50s. For instance, uh, there's a paper by Ritchie uh, where you know, looking at uh, polaritons and surfaces and understanding the physics of this was not uh, so surprising. It wasn't until the 1970s when there's a couple papers, uh, one by Fleischmann and then one by Van Dyne, where they looked at uh, enhancements in Raman scattering from local uh, molecules within roughened metal surfaces and ruffled, roughened metal electrodes. And the enhancements couldn't just be described by concentration changes. They instead had to uh, consider this as a um, uh, uh, something else going on. Uh, it then, through multiple efforts of various, uh, various researchers, identified that this was actually coupling to what we now call a localized surface plasmon, basically taking this quasi-particle and forming a coherent, this coherent oscillation within a confined antenna geometry. Think of the radio frequency antennas uh, that we see around, or you know, the radio antenna on your car, right? Uh, now just scale that down with the wavelength of the radiation we're talking about to optical frequencies. These are really, really small, deeply sub-wavelength in scale, so nanoscale variations in the roughness of this film provided these local antennas that could collect more efficiently uh, uh, optical energy at those frequencies. And if that optical frequency, that energy of the light co corresponded with the laser, uh, the laser excitation that we're using for the Raman, you'd get this huge enhancement in the Raman scattering rate. 
so this resulted in single molecule detection in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, and then with a paper from Thomas Ebison's group uh, in the late uh, 90s, they observed within a thin metal film with periodic arrangements of holes that the transmission of light through those periodic arrangement of holes uh, result, you'd actually get more light through than you'd predict based off the open area. Uh, think if you had, you know, a window with, uh, uh, you know, wood pilings on it and you shone light through it and somehow you got more light through uh, because the light never uh, was absorbed or reflected off of the wood. It was like all of it got through. And so in this case, it turns out that these surface plasmons were actually providing a collection and a funneling effect through those holes so that it would open up the absorption cross-section or the collection efficiency of those holes and therefore allow more light through. I have a quick question. Because I always, as, as the person who dabbles a little bit in this, I, I always think of it as you're exciting the area where you wouldn't expect transport through to happen it's just a metal film and that these plasmons carry energy kind of along the surface down the edge of the hole and out the other side mm -hmm. is that not quite right or is that about right no i think that's a good that's a good approximation of it you want to yeah you can think of um it's kind of in that what we'd now call extraordinary optical transmission um there's a coupling between the propagating mode in a metal surface with this localized resonant behavior within this uh, uh, open hole um, that kind of leads to that funneling. So the, you know, it's mm. a bit more physics to it, but that general concept is a good understanding of what's going on. All right. You can tell me I'm wrong. It's fine. But no. it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, okay. Approximately correct. Yeah. And uh, so that really, in my view, that kind of kickstarted the field of plasmonics. Um, you know, originally people were looking at potentially realizing waveguides uh, for replacing optical fibers for on-chip uh, to enable like nanoscale uh, uh, optical interconnects like that could be com uh, compatible with electronic circuits or create all photonic circuits that could be uh, competitive in size scale with these electronic systems. Uh, and a number of people got into this field. Uh, along the way, this kind of broadened into a number of different approaches. Um, uh, one of these being metamaterials. There was uh, the idea going way back to, again, the 1950s or so with a paper from Vesselago where he report, uh, discussed that when you're solving for uh, the index of refraction using the permittivity and permeability of the material, we always assumed that uh, the square root of that number, um, which uh, would be real, uh, the real component, this positive index. But there's actually a negative root that also, when you have a, you know, the square root of the product of these two numbers, you can have the negative index as well. And there's, if you have a negative permittivity and a negative magnetic permeability in the material, you can also get a negative index of refraction, which would actually bend light the wrong way. And so a great deal of work went into this. They uh, were able to demonstrate this uh, experimentally broad number of groups were uh, showed this, and this is a great deal of uh, experiments at the time in the early 2000s, and that kind of kick-started, again, the field of metamaterials. Well, the field of metamaterials is now expanded a great deal into what it encompasses, but it was originally designed to be optical properties or properties in general that we don't find in nature. So can we make artificial materials to realize uh, uh, properties that we're, we can't find in natural materials? Yeah, the classic one is always negative index materials. Yeah, uh, where light bends the direction opposite you would expect from a natural um, material like water. Yeah, so the beautiful there's a really beautiful paper uh, doing some calculations of what this would look like uh, that were done by Martin Wegener um, at Karlsruhe, and he showed what it would look like if you think of the refraction effect of when you place a straw in a glass of water you see the straw is kind of broken. Well, if this was a negative index of refractive, uh, refractive material, the straw would look like it's coming in from one side and it would be broken and the other, inside the water it would look like it's on the other side of the glass. Um, kind of like the mirror image of what you'd expect. Right. 
And that's for like if if the water itself was a negative index, the bulk of the water. Yes. But the the I, I think a lot of the work that's been done to date has been more in two D uh, and less three D. Yes, and it's also been much more narrow band than like the entire visible range. I right. put that out there purely as a conceptual image, since it's usually something hard for even some of us in the field to get our heads around what it actually means and entails uh, and would imply. Right. We'll put a link to that picture in, a sh- in the show notes. Um, and the thing is, I mean, in 3D, it's it's hard to make some of these nanoscale features um, well. So we can, because of the semiconductor industry, we can do it pretty well in 2D. Um, we have a harder time to do it in the bulk. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the areas where we would benefit from advances in, in process technology. But um, yeah, so we've done a lot of that. We still can do a lot of things with 2D, sometimes called meta surfaces. Um, but uh, that's the majority of what's been done um, have been in 2D. So yeah. Um, and that these two fields, kind of nanophotonics and metamaterials, sometimes are you know talked about in the same breath. They're kind of related. Um, metamaterials maybe a specific part of nanophotonics, um, but even you know we say nanophotonics, and that probably came from wanting to uh, work with uh, visible light being several uh, hundred nanometers in wavelength and needing to use nanoscale features. Whereas if you were going to work, let's say in the infrared. With longer wavelengths, you can still confine it at maybe nano is good, but you could do it at other types of confinement too. You don't have to be nano. Yes, agreed. In fact, actually, if you're thinking about the term nanophotonics, this is one of these um, reasons why I think infrared nanophotonics has a different infrared or terahertz nanophotonics has a different connotation than say nanophotonics in general. If you look at mm-hmm. Abbey's diffraction limit, which states the most you can focus light is roughly uh, the free space wavelength over twice the index. So let's think of traditional materials. In the visible, you have you know you can get as high as say an index of four with germanium. So lambda over eight is possible. So if I'm starting with green light, let's say you know 530 nanometers and I couple this into a germanium uh, optical dielectric resonator or antenna, or uh, I'm already, you know, in the nanoscale regime with the wavelength to start with, and then I'm compressing it by a factor of eight due to that index. So I'm really nanoscale already. Right. If I shift to the infrared where, you know, especially the mid-infrared, we're looking more like three micron wavelengths out to a hundred micron wavelengths. The, even with you know lambda over eight, uh, lambda over eight, you're not getting that far into the nanoscale domain, even right. at three microns. Ten microns, you're not getting into nanoscale at all, right? And you start pushing beyond that, you're not getting anywhere close to that. So, to be able to achieve infrared nanophotonics, this implies using some uh, extreme compression of light. Uh, for instance, what could be achieved through, say, uh, polaritonic excitations, like I talked about at the beginning of uh, the discussion with surface plasmons. Right. And so while we're talking about the infrared, what what, what is interesting about the infrared? And, and I'm interested, I mean, talk maybe a little bit about uh, the the near, or the, let's say the mid and the far, is, okay. or even beyond that into the terahertz. Yeah, so if we start within the mid-infrared, this is a spectral range where... Um, You have uh, pretty much every molecule, every uh, material has some molecular vibration or atomic or crystalline vibration uh, that has a resonance in this band. So this is what we call the fingerprint band. And to a broad degree, we're looking at uh, using, you know, people use infrared spectroscopy to understand and identify chemical uh, uh, constituents within liquids and solids and various things because of those vibrational uh, characteristics. So that can give you a fingerprint of what you're looking at. So if I'm thinking of trying to do chemical sensing, um, this is one really powerful way to do that. Another is there's what's called atmospheric windows. Uh, In the three to five micron band and eight to 12 micron uh, band, uh, the atmosphere doesn't absorb or scatter light uh, with any real efficiency. This means if you take a you know, nine micron laser and I shine it uh, along the horizon, it will propagate all the way until it hits 
the horizon. Uh, there's nothing in the at or hits another object, but there's nothing in the atmosphere like there would be with uh, uh, most other uh, wavelengths, which uh, would actually cause that light to dissipate. So I'll I'll stop you real quick. Wouldn't it be great uh, if we could somehow coax the Earth to emit light at that wavelength? Um, We'd help the climate change problem pretty quick if we just (laughs) let that light out through the atmosphere into outer space versus getting collected. This actually has been – this is one of uh, two different approaches. There's the idea – I believe Capasso's group was the first first one to do the math on this, but work out the potential for using uh, the – uh, the heat from the sun as your source, uh, and then the earth as a heat engine that could dissipate energy through those atmospheric windows, uh, to space, uh, using, um, uh, these atmospheric windows, uh, and trying to figure out what the efficiency of using the earth as a heat engine. Uh, that's a really interesting thermodynamic, uh, problem that was there. Uh, that's been put out there. And then also some of these radiative um, uh, coolers were basically right. trying to use that atmospheric window. You can collect over a broad band uh, and then uh, preferentially dissipate that heat um, through radiative cooling um, uh, in those atmospheric windows. Yeah, those things are are really cool. So this is the idea here, uh, for those who haven't seen them, is that you coat your house with this fancy material and uh, it would under broad sunlight, when the sun is shining, it would cool your roof and cool your house. And the way it does that is by being very reflective in the visible, extremely reflective. And so all the visible light just reflects off and doesn't get absorbed. Uh, and then it also, on top of that, is very as efficient as possible, um, emitting in the infrared and sending that energy out through the atmospheric window that Josh is talking about. And I think people have demonstrated that you can get cooling of a surface uh, – what 10 20 30 degrees in the sunlight yeah i believe something like that uh sean Wei's fan uh had a you now this device was i believe held under vacuum but i believe they reported <laughs> a 40 degree c drop uh i would need to verify that i don't have that at my hands but i think that is correct in broad broad sunlight in broad sunlight yeah right so. which is is pretty counterintuitive if, if you haven't thought about it yeah um, okay, In fact, so... I would say Sean Wei is uh, probably the, you know, the one who really is driving that uh, part of this field forward. So there was, if you read that paper, there was references to the work that happened several decades earlier, uh, where they struggled to show any cooling, and uh, it was likely because they didn't have good enough reflectors in the visible. Yeah. Uh, that you really have to have good reflection in the visible for the infrared part to matter. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's the infrared. So we can send light long distances if you're in the atmospheric window. Um, also, I guess I was going to add that kind of anything at finite temperature emits yep. infrared light, right? So if you uh, are wanting to uh, map someone's thermal signature or the thermal signature of an airplane, you can think about what that might be useful for. Uh, you can do that in the infrared, and you can you can sense it from long distances uh, if it's in that atmospheric window. Yeah. And the one challenge that I would raise then is uh, while we have ubiquitous optical materials for visible uh, visible frequency ranges, we have real challenges in the infrared with the availability of materials. So the long free space wavelength limits pixel resolution for those cameras um, basically, you can't make the pixel much, uh, certainly much smaller than the, uh, the free space wavelength. So if I'm at eight microns, I'm not going to have an eight, you know, a pixel that's 100 nanometers unless you use some other approach like polaritonics. Um, you also aren't even getting to, you know, diffraction limited pixels traditionally because the materials you're using are uh, more difficult to package. For instance, mer- uh, mercury cadmium telluride usually needs a flip chip bonded approach where you grow the material on one thing and you bond it to another. Uh, and so your pixels, just due to the process, the packaging efforts have to be bigger. You add to that the optics. Uh, for instance, the ideal infrared windows are things like uh, that are sem- uh, translucent or opaque like germanium or uh, 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 zinc, teller- uh, zinc sulfide, zinc sel- uh, selenide, things like that. Um, it complicates uh, an already more 
complicated alignment and uh, operational system where you're dealing with infra, uh, invisible infrared light, at least to our eyes, long free space wavelengths, and then materials that don't cover the whole spectral range, uh, and also that are tend to be, have other material problems like you know absorbing water or being translucent or um, opaque and things like that. I think this is a great point. I mean, we we take for granted the visible and all the materials and detectors and sources that we have available to us in the visible and even the near IR. And uh, it's very easy to forget that that's been around a while. I mean, we've been looking at things since the dawn of time, but uh, in, in, in the visible regime. But we've really spent a lot of time developing that technology, and the infrared has been much, much uh, slower to develop. Yeah. So, okay, so that's the mid-IR. Now let's talk a bit about the far IR. So you keep going out to longer wavelengths, and what happens out there? So when you're talking about the far IR, a lot of, uh, especially once you get into the terahertz, uh, you have a lot of rotational spectroscopy, which, unlike vibrations, you're now looking at rotations of molecules or very he- uh, re- vibrations of very heavy uh, atoms and very heavy molecules. Uh, you also, uh, this is, if you think of those new... Uh, you know, terahertz screeners. These are the ones at the airport where you have to hold the ha- your hands above your head. These mm-hmm. are screening to look for anything on your body. Um, this can be transparent to clothing, um, uh, transmit through clothing, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, and thus um, uh, can detect hidden objects and things like that. So it has a lot of utility and security. There's also things like detecting um, ice in clouds, for instance, uh, uh, verifying the ice content in a cloud for, say, a drone flying or airplane flying, uh, atmospheric sensing, uh, these um, for environmental uh, uh, processes. And for all of these spectral ranges, you're looking at uh, uh, a lot of application in astronomy and astrophysics, where you know, depending on what the features we're looking at and how far away they're coming from, uh, is going to dictate the frequencies at which we need to detect them. So this is why when you're looking at telescopes, you'll have everything from, you know, uh, X-ray telescopes all the way out into the infrared. And so developing those technologies can also help under, uh, our ability to understand and detect radiation from space and thus the universe around us. So uh, two things I wanted to say. One was uh, terahertz. You know, I still try and wrap my mind around what that is. But as a spectroscopist, I speak, I speak the language of wave numbers. Yeah. And uh, I think that community started calling things terahertz because calling it the really far IR just doesn't sound as good as calling it the terahertz. Yeah. And uh, that's my personal thought. And it will also depend on who you talk to, what they're defining. Um, right. Where the terahertz cutoff. in you know, true terms would be single digit terahertz. So, uh, this, you know, we're talking, you know, thousand microns, few hundred micron wavelengths. Um, if you want to uh, talk to a lot of terahertz spectroscopists, they would consider terahertz spectroscopy including hundreds of gigahertz as well. Um, the main point being this terahertz range kind of covers that, br- uh, bridges that gap between the electronic uh, domain, like where we have microwave frequencies, um, all the way down to, you know, DC, zero frequency, um, and serves as the bridge into the optical regime. Right. Uh, And I'm going to apologize uh, to those who don't do optics who are listening because uh, we've thrown around uh, wavelengths, we've thrown around wave numbers, (laughs) we've thrown around uh, frequency in in hertz, we've thrown around, I guess, gigahertz, terahertz. So uh, we're all talking about the same electromagnetic spectrum and just using different units. And we'll find a good link in the show notes to... um, show you all those uh, units on the electromagnetic spectrum. So for those who aren't familiar with it, you can get a sense. And it just takes time working in the field, and you will also be conversant <laughs> in this way. But it's not something that happens over overnight. One of the best tools that I have found for this is uh, Naomi Hellas's website. Uh, yeah. has a converter that goes between energy and electron volts, frequency and hertz or terahertz, to wave numbers, to microns. Uh, you put in the number, and it gives you all the other values automatically. Right. It's been a really simple tool. <laughs> Search for plus and conversion. And while you're there, you can check out some of the unbelievable amounts of work that come out of Naomi Hallis's group as well. So Yeah, I should try and get her on the podcast. She would be a good guest. Uh, the That website is probably uh, 
the best outreach activity she's ever done. She probably didn't expect it to be so important, but uh, I think researchers the world over use that simple tool every single day. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's just connect the two. If you're working out in the mid and the far IR and the all the way out way into the really far IR, the terahertz, then um, you'd really like to use the concepts of nanophotonics to make the structures that you're using to manipulate these wavelengths of light smaller than they would be from classical optics, yes. right? Um, and so this is really what your lab specializes in. And I was hoping you could uh, maybe pick a project that you're working on now at Vanderbilt and, and kind of take us through uh, why it's important and, and what it is that you're trying to do. Sure. So one of the things we're currently looking at, uh, or one of the broader classes of areas that we're looking at is looking at what I call, what I like to refer to these as these hybrid materials. Um, and so you can look at, uh, I mentioned before, you had these things called plasmon polaritons. Uh, this is when you're coupling uh, light with a oscillating electronic charge, like an electron or a hole in a um, uh, conductor like metal, silver, and gold are the predominant cases in the visible uh, spectral range. But when we shift out to the infrared, we're typically looking more at highly doped semiconductors. Um, and so one of the really uh, most, one of the super exciting materials that's come out is one of these Van der Waals crystals in the form of graphene, right? Uh, where by changing the Fermi energy or changing the carrier density is another way of saying that in the graphene, you can actually tune spectrally where it supports these modes and what they look like, how, how tightly confined, how short is that wavelength? Um, another type of material uh, that you can use is what we call a phonon polariton. Uh, in this case, you're using a polar crystal. So, for instance, silicon carbide is probably the most widely explored example. Um, silicon carbide works because your charge is on the form of the ions on that lattice. So because of the difference in uh, the attraction of those atoms or the electronegativity of those uh, atoms uh, to the bonding electrons, the electrons are going to pull closer to one of the atoms than the others. In silicon carbide's case, Carbon will be more electronegative. Uh, it's going to pull the bonding electrons closer to it, so it has a partial negative charge. Now, if I induce a vibration, or what we call a, la a phonon, this is a coherent oscillation of the uh, crystal, um, I now am effectively inducing a coherent charge oscillation at the same time. If you look at a uh, nonpolar material, for instance, silicon, you don't have that charge separation. So while there's still these lattice vibrations, you can't couple the free space light to it um, to get this uh, uh, phonon polariton to form. Now, this gives you, there's a whole broad range of these. There's actually a really beautiful review by uh, Dmitry Basov um, that came out in Science a couple years ago, and I had one with Tony Lowe, uh, Frank Coppins, and several others uh, in Nature Materials about the same time, where we looked at the various types of polaritons in these materials. So there's a whole broad suite or possible. Uh, you just need a charge and light that can couple. But these two, these plasmon polariton and the phonon polariton, are the two most widely explored uh, to this to date. Now, both have their benefits. Plasmon polariton, if I change my carrier density, I change the frequency at which it works. So it gives me a, a tuning knob. And if you think of all the uh, things we've developed in um, uh, electronics, uh, if you can modulate that, you've now, you can actually modulate that behavior. So you have a means of achieving active uh, control of that device. Um, one of the downsides is electrons scatter very fast. They, if I have this coherent movement of all these electrons together, they tend to uh, bounce off of the atoms uh, in the lattice that they're uh, passing through, bounce off other electrons and all these other uh, various scattering pathways that reduces how long that polariton can live. Um, the consequence of that is your resonance, your antenna line width, or your resonance line width is going to be relatively broad, uh, hundreds of wave numbers uh, or more uh, when you're out in the infrared. And also, if I'm looking at a propagating mode, it's going to decay really fast. Um, these phonon polaritons, because you're dealing with phonons, the optic phonon that you're coupling to has a much longer lifetime and therefore will have a much lower loss. Um, 
the modes actually propagate a lot slower. So for a mode propagating a surface, the benefit is somewhat reduced. But this means that mode, that residence time, how long it lives is much longer. So if I'm trying to do like enhanced chemical sensing, the mode is going to stay in place and live a really long time. If I'm looking at an antenna mode, like a localized system, like a nanostructure, I can have a really narrow line width. So I can very closely match the spectral uh, behavior of that mode with, say, a molecular vibrational mode to get a really strong enhancement if uh, done appropriately. One of the downsides is that it only works for a given material in a given spectral range defined by its optic phonons. So this can be on the order of a, you know, uh, a few hundred wave numbers, couple of microns for really broad materials, uh, or it could be as narrow as 10, uh, 10 wave numbers for certain other ones. And thus, I also can't take, say, silicon carbide, which has, uh, has operational, uh, frequent, uh, operational range of roughly 10.3 uh, microns to 12.5 microns. I can't use those, uh, that material in the far IR. It was only going to work where those optic phonons exist. So I can't like shift this around or tune it the same way I can with a plasma. So the idea of these hybrid systems is, can I start to couple some of the benefits of these two different types of materials or these two different types of polaritons such that I can gain the benefits of it? For instance, the spectral tunability of a plasmon with the low losses of the phonon polariton. And so, um, there's been some really work, uh, great work that's come out in this field. Uh, one of the first papers on this came from, uh, was implied by Frank Coppin's group, where they looked at a graphene on boron, hexagonal boron nitride structure. In this case, boron nitride supports uh, phonon polaritons, and the graphene could support plasmon polaritons. And they observed that uh, you know, when they calculated out the uh, optical behavior, uh, that spectral dispersion plot which gives us the uh, wavelength, how much we can compress that wavelength at a given frequency with these polaritons, showed that these two modes work together. They were coupled together. Uh, and then this was experimentally demonstrated by Dmitry Basov's group, where they actually showed not only that were these modes coupled together, but the propagation length, how long this mode moves before it decays, was longer than either of the two components. So this is kind of intriguing that you hmm. put these two together and it's not the sum of the parts. It's not the average of the parts. You need to uh, take into account the atomic interactions, these electromagnetic interactions, and really calculate out what the end result behavior is going to be. Um, and that's just a two-layer system? Uh, that was not just two layers. It was two material system. It was monolayer okay. graphene and I believe 50 nanometer thick boron nitride. Uh, okay. The reason for that is... A little bit more in detail, uh, boron nitride is what we call a hyperbolic material. So instead of the modes being confined on the surface, it's actually confined predominantly in the bulk of the material. So uh, you need to have some uh, finite thickness to that to be able to support these hyperbolic modes uh, with any efficiency. But that's kind of a, you know, a, 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 a subtle point in this case for the general concept. So... One of the things that I am finding now is trying to see, well, can we use all of the expertise we have in semiconductor physics, for instance, in heterostructure and super lattice growth, to achieve uh, these types of hybrid materials, whereby, for instance, aluminum nitride uh, has a, uh, its optical phonons within the 8 to 12 micron atmospheric window. However, its band gap is roughly 6 electron volts. So this is you know, deep, deep UV excitation to get this, uh, to get any carriers populated into this. Um, and so trying to do any kind of modulation scheme of the phonons, uh, the phonon polaritons in aluminum nitride isn't realistic with, you know, say electrostatic gating like we would with electronic devices. Gallium nitride, on the other hand, uh, is a wide band gap semiconductor that's used widely in the LED industry and now in power electronics can be grown epitaxially with aluminum nitride, and therefore we can electronically gate it. Uh, for instance, in high electromobility transistors, this is done quite often with gallium, nit uh, gallium nitride-based devices. And so the problem with gallium nitride, though, is its optic phonons are just to the low-frequency side. It's just outside of that atmospheric window. The question is now, if I make a super lattice of these structures, or 
where I alternate one on top of the other, can I use the plasmonic fields in the gallium nitride to modulate the phonon behavior of the aluminum nitride? And this is one of the areas that we're trying to push at now. Um, because basically taking this concept that we had from the graphene boronitride structures that were uh, demonstrated previously, can we do this in more traditional semiconductor physics, uh, uh, physical systems, uh, and now where we could actually electronically gate these and this could be translated into devices in a much near uh, near term. I see. Um, are you doing the the synthesis of these heterostructures in your lab, or are you collaborating with them? No, this is all in collaboration. So uh, we have collaborated with folks, uh, obviously, from the Naval Research Lab um, uh, for three nitride, for instance, these gallium nitride, aluminum nitride structures. We're also uh, collaborating with Stephanie Law at Delaware and mm -hmm. uh, Sandia with Andy Alleman. Uh, we don't actually do any of the growth. That's not our expertise. And as you being someone who does growth, uh, to do growth well, I think that kind of has to be your primary focus. Otherwise, <laughs> kind of dabbling, at least in my opinion. So, Yeah. No, gro growth is challenging. So is characterization. Okay. Uh, this is why collaborations, uh, when they work well, uh, work well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, I have all these questions about this, uh, but you don't have that much time. So uh, we might have to have you back in two years. <laughs> tell tell <laughs> us more going about a few more that. Minutes, sure. Um, but I, I did want to spend some time uh, talking about uh, your experience at the Naval Research Lab and, and, and comparing and contrasting that experience with, uh, with Vanderbilt, uh, a university. So you worked at NRL for 13 years. and um, well, yeah. 12, sorry, did did uh, a lot of great work. Um, and so I was hoping you could first describe the mission of the military laboratories and specifically NRL. Um, and first, why don't you start with that? You know, what what's the mission of NRL? What are, What's the goal of the people that work there? So NRL is different than most of your most of the DOD labs uh, in that it is what's called a, um, a corporate laboratory. Basically, like university professors, we pitch programs both internally and externally um, to uh, as to what we want to do, and we need to fund ourselves. So if we're not funding ourselves, we're either getting put on someone else's project to help them out or we're finding a job. Um, the goal of NRL is everything from really basic science to early applied uh, that has some Navy relevance. Now, of course, what we call 6-1 research. Uh, this is basic, really fundamental research. Uh, think of the stuff I'm talking about here, like these you know, heterostructures and uh, trying to understand the underlying physics. Um, you know, how much Navy relevance that has? Uh, well, infrared spectroscopy, infrared communication, things like that could have Navy relevance, and therefore that's good enough. As you move to more advanced, you know, like that first little widget that you're trying to make, you know, showing Navy relevance, uh, might be more of, all right, well, we have this electronic device that w can work, potentially work at high powers, and the Navy wants high-power electronics uh, so they can have an all-electric Navy, uh, something like that. And then, of course, as you move further and further on down the line, that Navy relevance term takes more and more meaning you know, to the point where uh, you, know, you could be investigating um, uh, uh, components that are actually going on a ship or going into a plane, right? Um, all of my work was in that you know, basic to early applied efforts. Um, and so really the mission there is try to come up with what the warfighter or what the Navy is going to want and need, say, 15, 20 years out. And so uh, for the Navy then, how do they and where do they develop actual technologies that are used by the warfighter? Oh, so there's a lot of these other, you know, uh, you know, Naval war Surface Warfare Centers. Um, there's obviously uh, uh, a number of scientists working at those uh, sites. There's also folks at NRL doing things like that. Um, it just depends on which space you're working in. Um, you don't find too many people who are doing, or at least I can't think of any, who are doing the early applied work and then translating that all the way into the fleet, for instance. Right. Um, but the Navy still has to do that. So even though NRL does the 6-1 mostly, then there's other components of the Navy that do in 6-2 and beyond. Well, the NRL will do a lot of 6-2 and also a good amount of 6-3, which is like early applied, a little later applied. Um, you know, the more advanced, like what we call 6-4 beyond, 
uh, most of that is done at a lot of you know these other centers where um, you know they'd be taking technologies that have developed out of these various programs and saying you know what I think this is a good fit for this application and then trying to get that uh, tested out and verify that it would actually work. So then I'm curious how then it's different than a, like AFRL. So AFRL also has a funding component in many cases as well. So a lot of Air Force uh, uh, research lab, uh, many of them also have some funding that they, uh, a funding portfolio that they are distributing. Um, we always joke that NRL is a funding sink, not a source. Because <laughs> um, the Office of Naval Research handles all of the funding for the Navy from 6-1 to wherever it finishes. I don't remember the <laughs> top number. Um, in the Air Force or in the Army, the Army Research Office or the Air Force Office of uh, Scientific Research, AFOSR, they handle the 6-1 research. As you get to the higher levels, that's handled through things like AFRL uh, and above, uh, or ARL. Components. Right. Right. So the, it's my understanding the founding of NRL kind of has an interesting story. I mean, when was it founded and, and why is it where it's located? So, yeah. Um, I don't have all the history perfect on this, but... But you had a minor in history. What do you yeah, I do, I do. I, <laughs> just forgive me if I make some minor mistakes. So uh, after World War I, it was determined that uh, the U.S. was w- pretty far behind in naval technology compared to um, our counterparts around the world um, that we might potentially have conflicts with or have to align ourselves or would be aligning ourselves with. Uh, And it was actually Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, not Thomas Edison I mentioned earlier, who's uh, the one who did the extraordinary optical transmission stuff, uh, that came to Congress and and strongly advised that we create this. Well, Congress and the Navy agreed. They thought it uh, was a great idea. Negotiations ensued. They started coming up. Uh, Thomas Edison wanted it to be in Menlo Park. Um, the Navy wanted it close, the Navy and Congress wanted it in D.C., uh, the ones that the money won, and so it ended up in D.C. Uh, Thomas Edison then said, I think the quote was something like, nothing productive was ever going to come out of NRL because it was too close to the admirals and too close to Congress, and so he didn't want anything else to do with it. Yet, uh, our major awards were named after Edison. <laughs> we have a bust of Edison at the front gate. <laughs> um, and so he, he's really the one who kind of instigated it, uh, but there was certainly a significant disagreement about where it was going to be placed. So, Wasn't a lot of the early like radar stuff done along the Potomac River? Yeah, so a lot of the testing, I don't want to say the, necessarily the original concepts for that. That was mostly British, okay. from my understanding. But a lot of the original testing of the actual devices uh, and therefore the translation of that towards um, the fleet was done across the Potomac River at NRL. Also, a lot of the, uh, the original GPS testing and development was done at NRL. Um, so this might be off limits, and, and you can say so, but I was going to ask what uh, motivated you to leave NRL for Vanderbilt. Oh, no, that's not off limits. Well, I'm sure as you recognize, our uh, motivations change as we get older. When I was younger, really... It was trying to just come up with, you know, the next new key result, that really exciting uh, thing that was going to come out. Um, And I really, I think in retrospect, I really needed the um, advice of all of those folks around me, kind of guiding me, keeping me from, you know, going off on all the tangents I wanted to do and kind of keep me focused in uh, various areas. And I never really wanted to teach. I didn't really want to have, you know, I obviously had graduate students that worked in the lab with me and I had postdocs who worked for me, uh, but that was not really something I was highly motivated by. But as I got a little older, I started noticing, you know what, I really enjoy seeing, you know, my students and postdocs do this instead of me. Not so much I didn't enjoy the work, I do enjoy being in the lab, uh, but more so the excitement of seeing that student, you know, find that really cool thing and rush into your office and say, look what I found, was a lot more enticing to me. Um, couple that with, you know, family considerations of my kids are getting older, 
DC has really heavy traffic. Uh, it can be fairly expensive to live. Uh, and therefore, finding areas where you have a reasonable commute so you can still see your family, but live in a, a, like a good school district or you can afford private schools, um, all these things piling up. And then getting asked to interview at a couple different places made me think, you know what, let's give it a shot. And then after going on the interviews um, and having talked to some of my other uh, colleagues in academics, um, I, you know, was completely sold that, you know what, I think it's time for uh, the transition. And how's it going? Love it. Busy as hell. I think I'm busier than I've ever been, but (laughs) it has been, it's a wonderful challenge. I absolutely love teaching and I'm really enjoying, you know, working with grad students I have the pleasure of having, I think, uh, in my view, one of the world's best postdocs uh, who's really helped get my lab set up. It's a guy named Tom Foland. Uh, I've been able to rely on him a lot so that I can focus on a lot of proposal writing and developing my teaching uh, uh, to the degree I think it requires. Uh, So, yeah, a lot of lucky things came along the way to make it go well, um, but it's been a wonderful move. Glad to hear it. I wanted to thank you for taking time to chat today on the podcast. It's been great, and I hope you'll come back sometime soon. Would love to. Thanks very much, Mike. I appreciate you having me on. You've been listening to Nanovation. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating or write a review on Apple Podcasts. Show notes are available at fillerlab.com forward slash nanovation. Nanovation is recorded in the Marcus Nanotechnology Building on the campus of Georgia Tech. Andrew Cannon edits the show. I'm Mike Filler. See you next time.